My name is Eric Joss, and I'm the founder and director of the Master's Craftsman Ministry, based out of Wildwood Baptist Church in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share some of the exciting things the Lord is doing through this ministry. In this video, you will see there are many ways that you personally can become one of the Master's Craftsmen. You will also see a small portion of the people we've been able to impact, as well as some of the missionaries and churches we have been able to help around the world. It is our desire that you'll be willing to serve the Lord with us by going on one of our construction mission trips. The experience will change your life. It is my sincere hope that you will pray for our family as we seek to do His will. As the Lord leads, we ask that you will prayerfully consider supporting our ministry financially. Thank you again for the opportunity to share the Master's Craftsman Ministry. In the fall of 2002, while elk hunting in the mountains of Idaho, I had no idea that my life was about to change forever. Though I was a Christian, I had no interest or desire to serve the Lord with my life. Things were just as I wanted them. I went to church on Sunday, but the rest of the week was mine. During my dream hunt, I was able to harvest a small spike bull elk. However, the night after I got my elk, a blizzard settled in on us, dropping five feet of snow with a 30 mile an hour wind. The best part is, there was no forecast for snow. I believe God created a situation similar to that of Jonah to get my attention. Of course, we tried to dig our way out, but we were 15 miles from the blacktop road and we realized we would need help to get out. Though we were stranded, we were never really in any danger. But while sitting in the trucks for four days, waiting for a D9 caterpillar to plow us out, I realized there was nothing in my life of eternal consequence. I had done nothing that would last for eternity. I had never won a soul or told anyone about Christ. So I made God a promise. God, if you will clearly show me what it is that you want me to do, no matter what it is, I will do it. My broken spirit is exactly what God wanted. I didn't know it then, but that was the day the Master's Craftsman Ministry really began. Over the next three years, God began preparing the Joss family for ministry. In 2005, Wildwood Baptist Church voted to make TMC an official ministry of the church, and I began to present the ministry to churches for support and help as many churches as I could while still working a full-time job to support my family. At this point, it would appear the TMC was now set but God had not yet completed the transformation of what he wanted TMC to be. Previously, the focus of the ministry had been doing the actual construction work for the churches and missionaries. But God helped us to see that the reason for TMC to exist was to minister to people, not buildings. God realigned our priorities, and our new motto was, first building Christians, together building churches. Hello again. You know, I could spend lots of time showing you all amazing places around the world that the Master's Craftsman Ministry has gone over the years. And I could show you picture after picture of the projects that we've done. But I thought it would be best for the remainder of this video just to allow some men who have actually gone on our trips to tell you in their own words how the Master's Craftsman Ministry has changed their lives. Hi, I'm Dave Eldridge. I'm a bricklayer, just an average guy. Not called to be a full-time preacher or a full-time missionary. But I've always wanted to give my talents back to Christ. I got that opportunity through the Master's Craftsman. Since then, the Lord has blessed me with several trips overseas, including the jungles of Cameroon, Africa. I tell you, it's really changed my life. It's, changed, it's taught me to be a bold witness for Christ, which I always struggle with. And so I would encourage you, if you would like to go on a missions trip, get a hold of the Master's Craftsman. The Lord will bless you. Hi there, my name is Jared, and I had the privilege to go on a Master's Craftsman overseas missions trip not too long ago. And I just want to take a moment and share how that experience has changed my life. And there's three areas. The first one is that my faith and confidence in God's ability was strengthened. The second was being able to see what a missionary on a foreign field actually goes through. And the third is more of a conclusion of what am I really doing with my life? And the 
greatest thing that I could do is be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, start serving in my local church and preparing to go into full-time service for Him. Hello, my name is Jim Langendorf. I would like to share how the Master's Craftsman Ministry has changed my life. I reluctantly went on a construction missions trip with TMC to Romania to build an orphanage. While on the trip, the Lord began to show me things in my life that made me realize I wasn't truly saved. While I was active in my local church and had earlier made a false profession of faith, deep down I came to realize I needed to be saved. Because I've always struggled with pride, I didn't tell anyone while I was on the trip how the Holy Spirit was working on me. We returned home, and for more than a year following the trip, the Holy Spirit continued to deal with me. Satan, however, was trying to convince me that because I had been given so many opportunities for salvation, God surely would not save me. Finally, the battle was over. A close friend took the scriptures and showed me God is not willing that any should perish, and he led me to the Lord. Praise the Lord, now I'm saved. I truly believe the Lord used the missions trip to Romania to get me out of my comfort zone and to begin the process of changing my heart. I would encourage each of you to consider going on a master's craftsman trip. I speak from experience. It will change your life. Uh, I'm Dean Noonan, pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And uh, just wanted to take the opportunity to share a word about the Master Craftsman Ministry. Um, they, they have been a huge blessing to our church. We've had the privilege of supporting them now for over 10 years. And it is just, I believe, a great investment on the part of our ministry, helping them help ministries both here and around the world do some amazing things in regards to construction. But see, they're not just about building buildings. They're about building people. As Eric and the team has been involved in our projects, we have built over 45,000 square feet of building, and they have been a great asset to us, not just in getting those buildings built, but helping build our men as they team together with the Masters Craftsmen. I want to encourage you to get involved in this ministry. Pray for them, and if you can, support them. God bless you. And I just want to say a few things. Jim in the video, the guy that got saved, when he says he was involved in his local church, he was a deacon in his church and wasn't truly saved. So if you're here tonight and you're trusting in anything, or maybe you've just been like Jim was, as he says it in his own words, I was living the lie because he knew he wasn't truly saved. Maybe you're here tonight and you're in that same situation. You've been coming to church, but you've just never truly accepted Christ. Maybe that's your testimony. You can get that taken care of tonight because there would be nothing more than your pastor or myself or any one of the men of this church would love to do, show you from the Bible how you can be saved. You saw Jared. He was on that trip. He made a decision for the Lord during that trip. He felt the calling to become a pastor. I'm proud to say he's in Bible college right now. Probably just finished up his, this, his, his last bit of school for the year. But praise the Lord, he's now in Bible college. That decision happened on a mission trip with the Master's Craftsman. Just working on a stupid building. You see, folks, if you'll open up your willingness, if you'll open up your heart and say, Lord, I don't have much, but whatever it is I've got, I want you to have, it's amazing what God can do. But if you're going to hold what you have so tight in your hand that he can't do anything with it, nothing will happen. You see, I've traveled all over the world doing this. And while I've been doing this, the Lord lets me pick some of the low-hanging fruit. I get to enjoy an awful lot of stuff. 
And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you every day is a great time in the ministry. But I am going to tell you that there's a lot more good days than there were bad days. And I know one of the questions that you're asking in your mind right now is, I, I, I always neglect to introduce my wife. So, Judy, would you stand up, turn around, and show them who you are? Now you see why I walk around with a smile on my face all the time. <laughs> and what you're, there's a question that's burning in your mind, and you're thinking, what is a good-looking woman like that doing with a geek like him? Well, let me explain that. It wasn't until just a couple of years ago that she had LASIK eye surgery, and she could actually see what she got. And by that time, we had two children, and it was too late. She couldn't get out of it. And so <laughs> I'm praising the Lord for a blind woman who just married some goofball, you know. But the reality is, my life started out as a kid who was raised in a Christian-like home. Okay, my parents were Lutheran. And I would like you to pray for them because I don't believe they're saved. To this day, they're trusting in their religion, not in the Savior. And so I was in church every time the doors were open. And so I thought, hey, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm a Christian. I knew all the lingo. And one day during catechism class, the pastor asked, Eric, if you were to die, he singled me out. I don't know why, but he singled me out. You know, I never, I, I never caused trouble in class. <laughs> I never was a smart aleck or anything. But he singled me out and he said, Eric, if you were to die today and stand before God and he was to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Well, to be honest with you, I'd never thought about it. The only reason I was in catechism class is because my parents made me. And so I just fired off the first thing that came to my mind. And I said, well, I'm a pretty good kid. I don't smoke and chew and run with the girls who do, so I'm, I'd probably get in. And he said, no, that has nothing to do with it. You can never be good enough. And he said, it's because Jesus Christ died for your sins. Sounds good, doesn't it? So I thought, well, great, now I have the answer. And from that day on, I kind of looked at when I died, it was kind of like the prohibition and the speakeasies that someday I was going to die and I was going to stand in front of this door and I was going to knock on the door and a little trap door was going to slide open and they were going to say, what's the password? And I was going to say, well, Christ died for my sins. And I thought that's how it worked. And the truth of the matter is, I believed with all my heart that I had what it took to get into heaven because I had the answers. And so I was very secure and in fact, when I met this beautiful lady that is now my wife for 36 years, she asked me, do you, what are you trusting in? How do you know you're going to go to heaven? And what was my answer? Because Jesus died for my sins. I'm trusting in him. Now, I was trusting in him as far as, sure, I had the answer, but I had never repented. I had never asked Christ to save me. I just had a head knowledge. Satan knows and believes that Christ died for people's sins. But he's not going to be in heaven, is he? And so she didn't want to be unequally yoked, but I was able to convince her because I was convinced that I was going to heaven. And so we dated, and I started attending her church. And something that I noticed that was different from her church, she went to this Baptist church. And something that I noticed right off the bat that was different was at my church, they would read a little portion of Scripture. They had two pulpits. They had one over here and one over there. And this one they read the Scripture at. And then they pretty much put the Bible away for the day. And then the pastor would go over to this one and he would talk about whatever he wanted to talk about. And there wasn't any more Bible reading. But at her church, Wildwood Baptist Church, what was there, the pastor would say something, and then he would show you the scripture verses to prove it. And I, I, I wish I would have wrote the date down, the day that I got saved. I love it when people can tell you, November 3rd, 1944, at 2 in the morning, I got saved. I wish I could say that, but I'll never forget the service. I'll never forget the time. I'll never forget the message. That pastor preached a message and he told how you needed to repent and ask Christ into your heart. And I realized I had never done it. 
And that would have been okay. I still could have got around that, but then he showed the verses. And it was like, okay, now I can't get around what God says. I can pretty much argue with anybody, but I can't argue with God. Now, I was instantly faced with a problem. I'm sitting next to the lady that I want to marry. And I've convinced her that I was truly saved. And I'm just testifying here, folks. The last thing I wanted to do was tell to her that I was wrong. And going forward to an altar, can I just tell you that wasn't me? It is now. The Lord does work on you a little bit. He gets you to the tender parts. But at that time in my life, there was no way I was going to go down an altar. You'd have had to drag me. And so what I did is I grabbed a hold of the pew ahead of me, white knuckles and all, and I said, Lord, I just realized I'm on my way to hell. And I don't want to go there. I believe that you died for me. Will you save me? I repent of my sins. I don't want to be that guy anymore. I want to be one of yours. And that was the day that I got saved. Now, that was a long way from 2005 when this ministry got started. And you just saw how the Lord had to put a guy who pretty much was doing things for himself. You see, I had a job that paid very well. I was the director of maintenance for nursing homes. And basically, I was in charge of a city block of every kind of nursing home facility that you can think of. CBRF, apartments, skilled nursing, specialized care, the whole nine yards. And I did the hiring and the firing. And my supervision that I got, and I, everybody would love to have this kind of supervisor. Basically, once a year, the CEO would call me into his office, beginning of the year, and he'd say, Eric, here's a couple million dollars for your expense budgets for the year. Here's a couple million dollars for the capital improvements for the year. Here's a couple projects I'd like you to take a look at. Have a great year. Get out of my office. See you next year. Wouldn't you like to have a job like that? And basically, I was in charge, and nobody asked questions. And I loved my job. And so when I went on this hunting trip, that was another god for me with a small g. I loved hunting. How many of you here are hunters? Anybody? A couple. OK. We'll work on the rest of you. You'll get right eventually. And so when I went on this hunting trip, this was like a life experience for me. And I believe 100%. When I say that, that the, the Lord set up that circumstance, I'm telling you, there was no snow forecast whatsoever. Now, I know you're thinking, yeah, the weathermen miss the forecast all the time, right? But you got to understand, we were in the mountains, and we were 15 miles back into the mountains where no man goes. I <laughs> mean, you, you normally don't hunt that far back in. And so these guys that I was hunting with, they've lived there all their lives. They know what the weather can do in the mountains. And so they monitored that weather very closely. And for us to get caught in that snowstorm was like the chances of that were slim and none and slim left town, okay? These guys were seasoned veteran. They live there. They know. And they were totally caught off guard totally blindsided by this snowstorm because it was of God. There was, and, and you, you remember a guy by the name of Jonah who was on a ship and everybody else was paying the price for his disobedience? Yeah, my name is right there next to Jonah because those nine guys that were with me, they all had to pay a price for my disobedience. And I want you to understand, while we're sitting there in those trucks, this was not like, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do whatever you want. No, it wasn't like that. It was just, you put yourself in that situation. You're sitting in a pickup truck waiting for a D9 Caterpillar to plow you out, right? And the Lord just started to put on my heart, what if this was going to be my last day? And I, I, I challenge you to put yourself in that situation. What if today was going to be your last day? How would you fare? Now, I had a wife back home, and one of the thoughts that I had was, did I really pay that life insurance policy? <laughs> but 
But then I thought, well, she's good looking and a great cook. She'll be married in two weeks anyway. I don't have to worry about her. <laughs> but then it came to, like I said in the video, what did I really do that was going to last forever? And I challenge you, who have you shared the gospel with? Is there somebody that you can say, yes, I've shared the gospel with this person and they got saved? Now, you didn't, you didn't really save them. That was the Lord's doing. You were just the mouthpiece. But have you allowed the Lord to use you to win somebody? And I made God that promise. I said, Lord, if you'll show me clearly what you want me to do with, your life, with my life, no matter what it is, I'll do it. And again, I'm being honest here, folks. If I'd have thought God could do something with me, I wouldn't have made the promise. I'm just saying it like it is. Because I had my life exactly like I liked it. Things were good. We got off the mountain, and I forgot about the promise. And you see, I thought I was safe because I knew who I was, and I knew who I wasn't. And if anybody from my past life, when I was going through school, and up until 2005 and beyond, if you just said, Eric Joss is going to be a preacher, they would have laughed you out of the room. And we got off that mountain, and I forgot about it, but God didn't. And he started to put the vision of the master's craftsman in my mind. And like I told you earlier, it wasn't going to Africa. It wasn't taking teams. It wasn't about anybody else. It was just I thought I was going to do what I could do. But the Lord worked on my heart over a period of time. And what you see here in this video, and what you saw here, I could never dream that up. I'm not smart enough to think up all that stuff. I'm just telling you, God had a plan all along. And it's easy at this stage to look back and see the tracks in the sand of where he put me in that job at the nursing home to see that he was preparing me how to work with staff, how to work with volunteer help, how to organize projects, how to do budgeting, how to do building. My dad was a home builder, worked in the construction industry all of my life. It's very easy to see where he was putting me now, looking back. But at the time, I had no idea. So my point to you is, Make sure that you say to God, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Because you don't know where he's going to take you. I had no idea he was going to put me on five of the seven continents. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you I've done everything right. When I came and helped you with your project... That was very early in the ministry, 2010. We were struggling to figure out how we were going to do things. And that was in that transitional point where the Lord was starting to show that he wanted me to take teams. And when you hear this video say, our motto became first building Christians, together building churches, this, is, this video is just a small example of the men and women that I've had opportunity to minister to. And I want you to know, Pastor, we're not running an end run on a pastor. These people come to us, and we are 100% pastor. We want you to talk to your pastor. Don't come to me and think I'm going to be this super counsel to you. Because the first question that I'm going to ask you is, what does your pastor think? Because it is, he knows a lot about you, way more than I do. He knows your wiggles and your warts. I just think you're great because you're helping me with a roof. But we are ministering to these people. I have developed a relationship with men who tell me things that they would never tell anyone else because we've had a chance to work together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. The ladies have had a chance to talk to my wife. It's just amazing how the Lord can use you. And another ministry that I never expected this to become was a ministry to pastors. 
Now, us as members of a church would never expect that we cause the pastor heartburn. But you know what? We do. They love us. They pray for us. And sometimes we don't always treat them so well. And anytime you have a building project in your church, can I tell you, Satan loves to get in there. What color carpets should we get? What color should we paint the walls? What? The list goes on and on. And here's this pastor thinking he's going to charge hell with a water pistol. The Lord's blessed him with a big church and now he's got to expand. And as I preached this morning, Sandy and Toby show up. And these pastors feel like it was the worst thing that they ever did was to start this building program. Now what do I know? I'm not a pastor. But you know what? I can be a voice of reason. I can be a person who's just a shoulder to cry on. I can be somebody they can scream at. You see, ministry isn't always preaching a gospel sermon. Ministry isn't always teaching a Sunday school class. Sometimes ministry is just listening. Can you listen? Can you be a friend to somebody? It, isn't, it doesn't have to be a ministry to pastors, but you can listen to the guy who works across the workbench. He should know that when he's got trouble in his life, you're a Christian and you have something. And he can come talk to you. And that's when these guys are talking about when they, they wanted to give back to the Lord, they went on these trips and they got way much more than what they ever bargained for. Because they got around other good Christian men who have the same problems that they have. Who have the same failures as they have. And they can see that, hey, we're in this together. And so I encourage you to go on one of our trips and be part of the Master's Craftsman. But even more so, if you're thinking that the Lord wants you to do something, go talk to this guy right here. Even if you don't have something that the Lord wants you to do, that has, he's clearly given you, go talk to this gentleman. In your own church right now, you've got a need for Master Club. I, I'm pretty confident that in a group this size, there's somebody Somebody here in this room tonight that could fill those shoes. Now, I know it's scary, trust me. <laughs> when I came and told my wife that I believed that the Lord wanted us to be missionaries and that He wanted us to travel all over the world and help churches and missionaries, you see, her brothers are couriers for Christ. You support that ministry. And she watched her brothers go through the process of raising their support. And here we were starting out later in life with all of our nest feathered with all of those nice feathers. All of the security that that job brought. And she knew what they went through when they went into ministry. And her exact words were, what, Judy? I love you, but I really don't like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Imagine hearing those words from your wife. I love you, but I really don't like you very much right now. <laughs> Folks, it was scary. But you know what? God puts you many times in that situation. Look at Abraham, his son Isaac. He has to put him up on an altar, tie him up. And Isaac was not young at that time. Isaac knew what was going on. Folks, don't think this was some little infant that had no clue what was going on. He helped him carry the stuff there to the altar, didn't he? And here's Abraham. He's got to choose. Do I want to serve God and stick the knife in my son's throat? Or do I love Isaac more? And folks, that was the decision that my wife and I had to make. Do we love him more or do we love our junk more? And I'm up here telling you today that I would never go back to the nursing home. Now, I had three things in my life that the Lord had to clear out before I could do this. And I was talking with one of your ladies here this evening just before the service. And I'll be honest with you, somebody needs this tonight because 
I had a message all prepared, and this afternoon I'm sitting on the bed, and the Lord just said, nope, you're not going to do that. And I know you've had that already. And so I'm, I'm going to show you my sermon notes for today. So I, I know somebody needs this. You see this? This is my sermon notes for tonight. And I haven't even gotten there yet. So I, I, was, a, I was a prideful man. And there was three things in my life. One was my job. I loved my job. Two was I loved the fire department. And three was after my wife made that statement, she wasn't kidding. She was not happy about going into the ministry, and she was not bought into this. Now, I had to make a decision. Am I going to follow you, Lord, or am I going to not do what you want me to do? I decided I was going to follow the Lord. So I said, Lord... If you truly want me to do this, you're going to have to take away my desire for the fire department. You see, I was raised as a volunteer fireman. My dad was the chief. And so I just grew up with it. But I loved it. And you're going to have to take away my desire for the job. The third one is you're going to have to change my wife's heart because I can't go into ministry without my wife. She is my first ministry. The Lord started out with my job. First thing to go was my job. When I explained to you that they gave me all the leeway and all of that, that was under one CEO. Not too long after I made that promise and asked the Lord to start changing my heart about my job, they changed CEOs. They got a new CEO. He didn't trust anybody. This company was called Lutheran Homes of Oshkosh. Now, I was not Lutheran. I was Baptist. And you didn't have to be Lutheran to work in that company. But they had a chaplain. And the new CEO hired the chaplain. And the new chaplain said it's not his responsibility to win people to Christ, but to support whatever state of religion they were in at the time. He then hired an assistant chaplain who was a female and said that you can't trust the Bible because it was written by men and they put their male spin on it and God could actually be a woman. He then hired a music minister who is an open homosexual. So do you think I fit into that place any longer? Boy, I struggled. And one day I was getting ready for church, or excuse me, ready for work, and I said to my wife, you know, I just don't enjoy this job anymore. And I'm just as clear as a bell, I heard this bell in my head ring. Ding! You're getting what you wanted. You're getting what you asked for. I no longer had the desire for that job. Now, I didn't go to work the, the day after I asked the Lord to change my heart about my job and say, now i got to find a reason to hate my job. That wasn't it at all. God set up the circumstances to move me on. Make me uncomfortable. The next thing to go was the fire department. There was two factions in our fire department. One was we want to provide a good service to our community. The other was we want to have a men's club, a bunch of drinkers, and all that went with that. Now, obviously, I wasn't in that crowd. And those two factions were always fighting for the power. Well, guess which faction finally took over? And it was constant bickering, constant fighting. The meetings were always tension. And I was getting ready to go to a fireman's meeting. And I looked at my wife and I said, you know, Judy, this just isn't fun anymore. I really don't enjoy the fire department anymore. And that bell, that same bell went off in my head. And the Lord said, there's the other one. Now, the third one was my wife coming on board. And I don't think at the time that we were here to work on your project, she was not on board. And none of you probably knew. Because she was a good, dutiful, submissive wife. Oh, I shouldn't say was, she still is. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> She's even better now. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, nobody knew except for my pastors, God, her and I, that she wasn't on board with this ministry. But the truth was, I couldn't do a thing about it. Because that was between her and God. And the Lord taught me 
patience during that time. Because all I could do is pray. All I could do is ask God and say, Lord, bring my wife on board. If this is your will, bring her on board. Because the truth of the matter is, I kind of liken it to the little donkey that's on the Grand Canyon tour. You know how they, you, can, you can go on those tours and they'll take you down and you can see all the scenery and you ride little donkeys. When that donkey sits down and says, I'm not going any further, guess what? That donkey's not going any further. You can kick him, you can pull him, you can offer him, try to bribe him with a carrot, but that donkey's not going to move until that donkey decides to move. And my wife was not going to move until she decided to. And so it took the Lord some time during a missions conference at our church. She, she went forward. And she was given over, not giving in. You see, she was giving in to be with her husband. She was giving in to serve because she knew that was what the Lord had called us to. But her heart wasn't in it. And so once that third thing was in place, once my wife was on board, all that time while all of these things was happening, that's when the Lord was also working on my heart to say, what do you really care about, Eric? Where are you putting your efforts? What are you doing? Are you living for yourself? Or are you living for souls? I'd be willing to bet if anyone in this room came up with a cure for cancer, that if you knew somebody who had cancer, you'd want them to have that cure, wouldn't you? Well, folks, we got the cure for an eternity in hell. I think we would want others to have it. Now, I know you didn't want to hear just from me and hear about all my life story. So if you would, be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to get into God's Word just a little bit. And I said to my wife, I'm not going to be long tonight because I know the pastor's got to leave in the morning. What time do you have to leave? Probably around 6. No problem. We can make that. <laughs> we'll, we'll be done by then. And I'm going to just turn to another little passage here because I want you to get something first before any of this, what I'm going to talk about, is going to make sense. So let's have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to read you something here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this day that you've given us, Lord. We ask your blessing upon this evening. Lord, thank you for this opportunity for us to hear from your word. Lord, I just pray that if there's someone here tonight who's not saved, that they would accept you as their personal Savior. And also, if there's someone here tonight who's been feeling, Lord, I know that you want me to do something, but I've just been afraid that tonight would be the night that they would step out and say, Lord, I want to serve you more than I'm afraid. Lord, I just praise you for all that you're doing. I ask you now to take my lips, make them yours. I can't do this without you. And Lord, we ask that all the distractions be put away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In, amen. All right, first good amen I've gotten tonight. Probably the last one, too. I'm just going to read you from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were, or they are, and were created. You see, folks, I want you to get something straight in your heads right now. We think that all of this creation that we see when we go outside and we see the birds singing and the trees and all of that, we think God created it for us. The truth of the matter is, we're just part of the creation. Amen. This is created to bring Him honor and glory. You and I were created to bring God glory. Now, if I make a hay baler, I come up, I, I want to bale hay, and I build myself a hay baler, its job is what? to bale hay. It shouldn't make ice cream or shine my shoes, should it? It should bale hay. And if it's making ice cream, well, that might be tasty. That doesn't get my hay baled. And so when God created us to bring him honor and glory, we're to bring him honor and glory. And how do we do that? When he tells us to do something, we do it. And he tells us in his word that we're supposed to tell others about him. 
Now, he could have used rocks. He says, I could have made the rocks cry out. But the truth is, he's chosen to use us. Why? I don't know. Just look in the mirror and you answer that question. Why would he choose me? I have no idea why he'd choose me. I don't know why God does a lot of things. I can't honestly tell you why did he say that blood had to be shed for the remission of sins. I'm not God. But he has a plan, and it's perfect, and he said that's what had to happen. So that settles it, doesn't it? And so we are created for his honor and glory, and we do that by telling others and doing what he's told us to do. Go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He tells us that we're supposed to win souls. So to make him get honor and glory, we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. So as we look at Matthew chapter 25, this is very familiar. I'm sure you've seen this before. We're going to look at verse 14. This is the story about some men who were given some money. And it talks about talents, and I believe, obviously, this was referring to money. But let's just use the word talents. Our talents, our gifts, our abilities. This is for the kingdom of heaven in verse 14 of, of Matthew chapter 12, 25. It says, A man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Now why did he give some more than others? Well, I think he probably figured one guy maybe was a little more capable. One guy maybe he wasn't so sure about. But the truth is, he gave them something to work with. They all had something to start out with. There is not a single one of us in this room who doesn't have something to work with. The pastor's son there in the back of the room. I had his picture in my presentation, the video that you saw for years. And I can tell you with him with a hard hat on in a wheelchair, and I hope he doesn't mind that I'm sharing this, but I'm telling you, he was an inspiration to countless people that saw that video. Because here's a man who, by many standards, people would think, what can he do? But the truth was, he was doing what he could. He had that shovel, and what people would always say to me, after the video showed, when we were out in the back, they would say to me, I just couldn't believe the smile on his face. Folks, that had an impact on people. What can God do with what you have? So he gives out these talents. And straight away he took his journey. And then verse 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that had received two also gained two other two. Now these guys took what they were given and they did something with it. These two guys said, okay, I've been given a blessing here. I've been given an opportunity. I have been given a lot. Folks, can I tell you, I travel the world. I've been in a lot of third world countries. And there's not a one of us who wouldn't be considered a rich man in a lot of the places that I've been. Financially. I don't care how poor you are. I mean, literally, I've seen people who could take everything that they own, put it in a five-gallon pail and move. Everything that they own. Could that be said about you? The day we got married, I still had to borrow a pickup truck <laughs> to move into our apartment. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, folks, we have a lot of stuff that can be used for the Lord. A lot of stuff. 
And so these guys are given their talents. And it says here in verse 18, But he that received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Folks, you're not stupid. You know where I'm going with this. He's saying, I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to step out by faith. I might lose what I got. Folks, that's where my wife and I were at. We were just burying it in the ground, trying to keep our hands around it because we didn't want to lose it. And I dare say in a crowd this size, there's probably somebody who's in the same position here tonight. You're secure. You've got the retirement program working. You, but inside, the Lord's saying, no, that's not what I want you to do with what I've given you. There's souls out there who are lost and on their way to hell. I want you to bring me honor and glory. And you're burying a napkin in the ground. Folks, that's when the Lord has to step in and do like he did to old Jonah. That's when he has to take you to the woodshed and teach you a few things. And what does it say here in the story? It says, as we go on, verse 19, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. There's going to be a day of reckoning, isn't there, folks? One day we're all going to stand before him, and he's going to say, What did you do with the things that I gave you? And so he that received the five talents came and brought after five other talents and saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, What? Well done. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee, make thee the ruler over many things. Even Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You see, folks, you say, why won't God give me millions of dollars? Why, you know, well, are you, how are you dealing with the hundred bucks he's given you? Are you honoring him with that? The amount doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if it's the five or the ten or the, the one talent. Are you honoring him with it? And it says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, as Lord... Then verse 10, 13, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. This is the guy that had the two talents. He doubled them, just like the first guy. Verse 24, Then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And folks, here's where it really comes down to. And if we're honest, this is why we don't do what we're supposed to. Verse 25, And I was afraid. I think that's the major thing that keeps Christians from serving God. We're afraid of what people are going to say, what people are going to think. Nobody likes to be laughed at. Nobody likes to be called a Bible thumper. You know what they used to call me at the, at the nursing home? Jesus boy. I kind of thought it was a kind of a neat name. I, I kind of liked it. Jesus boy. I'd rather be called that than a lot of other things. But it was funny because when one of them had a problem, if their marriage was going bad, guess who they came to see? They came to see Jesus boy. They didn't go to the chaplain because they knew he had nothing. So this guy was afraid. And so he hid his talents. Folks, are you here tonight? Are you afraid? I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm, I'm just, I, and you can too. It's not wrong to be afraid. But it's a wrong to let your fear rule what you're going to do for God. Are you going to let your pocketbook dictate what you can do for God? In other words, is the money in your wallet going to say, okay, I'm only going to give this much because I need the rest? 
Or are you going to say, and get it actually right in your head to say, Lord, it's all yours anyway. Think about it. What are you really in control of? Can you take a breath without him? Absolutely not. I always tell guys, if you think you're really something, let God turn gravity off for a few minutes and let's see how you do. Can you imagine? It'd be a great weight loss program, wouldn't it? (laughs) But the reality is, we can't do anything without him. So really, what do we have that he already doesn't have? To illustrate this, and then I'm going to be done, I was over in Papua New Guinea. I was contacted by a missionary. I didn't know the man, never had met him before. And that's not uncommon. You know, when you work for free, you always have work. And our ministry doesn't charge for what we do. And so this missionary from Papua New Guinea, out of the clear blue, contacts me and said, hey, I got your name from so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Now, as I said in the message this morning, we always do a survey trip. And so I scheduled to fly to Papua New Guinea to meet this missionary. And I said, as long as I'm coming all this way, I might as well do something for you. I said, is there anything that you need? And he said, well, I could sure use some kitchen cabinets for my wife in the house that we live in here in the jungle. And I'm like, well, okay, you want me to build kitchen cabinets in the jungle. Now, if you know anything about building kitchen cabinets... That takes a lot of equipment. That takes a lot of tools. It takes a lot of specialized equipment. How do you get all of that equipment into the jungle, right? On that much notice. Now, I didn't know this guy, so I wasn't going to take a team of people who have never traveled with me before. This was the survey trip. So I walk into Chicago O'Hare Airport with 11 suitcases weighing 50 pounds each, for me. Do you know what overage charges are called in, in overage baggage fees? Do you know how they work the system for that? The first bag is $50. The second bag is $100. The third bag is $200. And so it goes. And when you get ridiculous, like 11 bags for you, they throw that formula right out the window and say, you're an idiot. We're going to really make you pay. I fully expected to be charged $3,000 in luggage fees. I was there with my credit card, fully expecting that's what I was going to get charged. So I walk up to the the check-in lady and I said, so how is my favorite check-in lady today? Now she's not stupid either. She sees the two carts trailing behind me with suitcases and I'm the only one standing there. It's It's not rocket science who those all are. And she says, you want a favor, don't you? And I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I do. And I explained to her where I was going, what I was doing, and why I was doing it. And she says, let me see what I can do. And she gets on her computer, and she's tapping away. And shh, shh, shh. All of a sudden, she looks at me, and she says, how does $300 sound? And I said, each? And she says, no, for all of them. I'm telling you, my credit card flew out of that wallet so fast, it almost had smoke coming off from it. (laughs) And so I got over there, flew all the way over there, got to Papua New Guinea, and I met a man by the name of Boost Man. Now, he's a Papua New Guinea native there, and Boost Man is a true native. He lives in a grass hut, just like you would picture the natives there in Papua New Guinea to be, okay? And Boost Man wanted to learn how to build kitchen cabinets. Now, folks, Boost Man's never going to have the opportunity to build anything like that. He's never going to have the tools. But his desire was to be there with us. And obviously, first building Christians, together building churches. We were thrilled to have Boost Man working alongside with us. Now, you've got to understand, Boost Man lives out in the jungle seven miles from the missionary. And Boost Man would be there sitting on the front porch of that missionary's house at 7 in the morning every day. And we worked until dark. And then Boost Man would walk 7 miles back home, uphill, both ways, in the snow, to get to his house. (laughs) Well, there were some hills, but there was no snow. He had a desire to serve the Lord and be with us and help with those cabinets. 
Now, on the last day of the trip, we're getting ready to leave. And you can see there's a book on my table that shows those cabinets that we built. And the last day, Booseman presented the other two men and myself that were with me these ceremonial wooden spears. And these spears he carved after he was done working with us. He carved those sitting in front of the campfire at his house with his jackknife. That's the tools that Booseman has. He has a hatchet and a, and a jackknife. And he carved those spears, and I'm telling you folks, I, I couldn't believe that he didn't twist them and heat them and twist them because when you spun that spear, it spun true. It was straight. And he carved a design into the whole thing, and it was elaborate. And I said, Boost Man, why did you do this? Now you've got to realize, folks, Boost Man is one of them people that I'm talking about that could take everything he has, put it in a five-gallon pail, and move. I have a beautiful home. I have a couple of cars. And I'm not, again, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying the Lord has blessed me just like he's probably blessed you. You've got stuff. What does Booseman have that I could possibly need or want? Right? But yet Booseman takes the time and carves this spear for me. And I said, Booseman, why did you do this? And he said, brother, I wanted you to know that I love you. He said, you came all this way from the United States to help the missionary that led me to the Lord. And he said, if having these kitchen cabinets will keep his wife happy and have him stay here, maybe he can lead some of my friends and relatives to the Lord while they're here. So I love you guys, and I wanted you to have this. Now, folks, can I tell you, it cost me $300 to get that spear home. <laughs> They got their money anyway <laughs> because it was too long and it had to be in a special box and all of that, whatever. <laughs> but guess where that spear is hanging? It's hanging in a very prominent place in my office. And every time I'm sitting at my desk, I look up and I see that spear. Folks, that's how it is with whatever it is you give the Lord. We're talking about a God who created it all just by speaking it into existence. There is nothing he needs from us. But there is something he wants. And that's he wants your heart. He wants you to say, I carved this spear for you because I love you. And whether it's this little bit of money that you put in an offering plate, if it's Whatever it is, your time, your talents, your gifts, whatever it is, I believe he's got it hanging on his fireplace. And he's saying, they did it because they loved me. Folks, where's your heart tonight? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe there's somebody here tonight who doesn't know the Lord as their personal Savior. If you're here tonight and you're not sure where you'd die, if you were to die today, with no one looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed, would you look up at me and just raise your hand? If you're not sure where you would spend eternity, I understand it's embarrassing. You don't want to be singled out, but it's too important not to get it taken care of. Maybe there's someone here tonight who says, you know, brother, the Lord's been dealing with me about somebody that I'm supposed to witness to. Would you ask the Lord for courage enough to witness to them? Would you ask him to give you the opportunity to witness to them? Maybe there's somebody here tonight that the Lord's actually calling into the ministry, full-time ministry. I don't know what that need is. And folks, don't forget, Ministry isn't always what we consider to be full-time ministry. Ministry is mowing the grass. Ministry is cleaning the bathrooms. Ministry is a hundred other things. Visiting a shut-in. 
taking food over to the neighbor, leaving a tract. There are so many ways. As the music begins to play softly, I'm going to turn the invitation over to the pastor. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with that side. Invitation's open. Altar's open. God's speaking to your heart. Maybe there's something that you've been holding on to you need to let go of. Maybe you've just given all kinds of excuses about why God can't use you. The truth of the matter is, and if, if boy, if you haven't gotten anything at all throughout the whole day today, is that God can, wants to, and desires to use you. And he has equipped you to do exactly what he wants you to do. You have the talent, you have the ability. You say, I don't have much of any, any of that stuff. What you have, he'll use. But you gotta give it to him. 